Question show time. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are, anywhere on my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them all up and I will answer them here. Uh, man, I, Paul, my voice might be a little off. We've had horrible uh, forest fires here on Vancouver Island and all across all of British Columbia for the last couple of weeks. And there's this awful smoke in the air and we're supposed to like not even be outside, but I'm risking it for you. All right. Let's get on with the questions. Subnet mask. Hey Fraser, with what we know, what's the probability that there's at least one other planet in the galaxy that we can survive on on the surface unassisted? What about in the supercluster? Right now, we don't know because the thing that is required for us to be able to live here on Earth is all of the plant life that generates the oxygen that's in the atmosphere to get this right amount. And so you would need to have some kind of life uh, that ideally, through its chemical process, generates oxygen. And that's the thing that we're going to need. There's going to be places for sure that we can go and we can handle the temperature. And there's, you know, there, there will be places that we can handle the pressure uh, without having to wear a spacesuit. But to be able to breathe unassisted without some kind of, you know, uh, uh, oxygen, you're going to need life that will produce that. And right now we only have one planet in the entire universe that we know of that has life that generates oxygen and that's here. Chad. Several times I've heard that the actual universe is much larger than the observable universe. My question is, how can we know this if we can't observe the larger universe? Or do we know this and it's just speculation? Astronomers don't actually know how big the universe is. All they know is that they know that the universe is so big that they can't tell how big the universe is. So astronomers have measured essentially the flatness of the universe. They've tried to calculate if it's like some gigantic sphere of universe, how big that sphere is. And right now it is a sphere that is so large that they can't calculate it. Now it could still be a finite volume, which is absolutely bigger than the observable universe. If we say can observe a sphere that is 90, two billion light years across, it could very well be that the universe is at least hundreds, maybe thousands of billions of light years across, or it could be infinite. And right now astronomers have no way to know, and we may never know. And that's sort of one of the weird things is you might live in an infinite universe. You might live in a finite universe and we may never be able to tell, but we know that there is a chunk of this universe, which we can ever interact with. And that amount of the universe is much smaller than the observable universe. And so even though it's finite or infinite, in the end, it doesn't really matter because we'll never be able to reach beyond what is the reachable universe. Nick Poshek. If SpaceX somehow went bankrupt, I'm sure that people would be lining up to purchase them at a discount. Yeah, in last week's question show, I didn't quite get to the second part of your question, and I apologize, which was, you know, if SpaceX went bankrupt, what would happen to all the technology, the Raptor engines, all these cool ideas? And the reality is that if any company goes bankrupt, then other companies can come in, snap up, pick up all their patents, all their intellectual property, all of their hardware, all of their rockets, and then manufacture them for themselves or sell off the parts to different other companies. So everything that's, the, if SpaceX were to go bankrupt, which there's no reason why they will, then all of the technology that they've already developed will already be available into the marketplace. It might just be that it gets picked up by Blue Origin or United, you know, United Launch Alliance or NASA or something like that. So, so don't worry. All of that technology is going to make its way into the world. Anthony, why do we call it microgravity instead of zero gravity? Is it just scientific pedantry? Well, here's the thing. Uh, when there are astronauts on board the International Space Station, even though they are at an altitude of, uh, what are 250 nautical miles, they are experiencing 90% uh, of the gravity that you experience down on the surface of the Earth. So they're still in a tremendous amount of gravity. The trick is they're moving so fast sideways that they are falling around the Earth. So it's not accurate to say that they're in zero gravity. The reality is there's no place that you can go in the whole universe that has zero gravity because you're always going to be affected by the gravity of something. It's just that you are falling towards different things at different speeds. And that's why people want to use the term microgravity instead of zero gravity, because at the end of the day, you're always just falling. Scott Rick, are black holes cold? 
So black holes are a bunch of things, right? There's the singularity, the part of the like, infinite density where all of this mass is mashed down into this tiny singularity. Surrounding that is the event horizon, which is the region from which you'd have to be going faster than the speed of light to be able to escape. Of course, you can't escape even if you can go faster than the speed of light. It's just that the escape velocity is faster than the speed of light. Um, but, uh, but the thing is, is that this is what, what Hawking figured out is that black holes will evaporate. And this is because these, these virtual particles are appearing right on the surface of black holes and, and going off into space. And the vast majority of these virtual particles are going to be photons. In other words, they're going to be light. And light gives you temperature. And so if you could look at a black hole's event horizon, you could measure its temperature. And for the most massive black holes, the supermassive ones, they are incredibly cold, just a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. The less massive, the smaller the event horizon gets, the warmer those uh, that the event horizon of that black hole is, the more photons that are streaming off of it. And when the black hole gets really small, just as it's about to die, it gets really, it gets red hot, eventually blasts off as gamma radiation, and then the black hole is, is gone. So, so in general, black holes are incredibly cold. They are a tiny fraction over absolute zero. They are way colder than the background temperature of the universe, and it's going to be uh, an incomprehensible amount of time until the universe cools down to the point that you could actually measure the temperature of black holes as being higher than the background temperature of the universe. Just one is besto. When you measure Louvoir looking at the planets around us, do you mean in our solar system, 10 light years, 100 light years? Louvoir, this is the large ultraviolet optical infrared telescope that we've mentioned on several episodes. We've interviewed uh, Brad Peterson, who is uh, the chair of the committee developing it. And Louvoir is going to be this general purpose instrument. It's going to be able to look at stuff here in the solar system, and it's going to be able to look at other planets going around other stars. And so when we we're talking about this comprehensive search for the atmospheres of extrasolar planetary worlds, it's going to be looking at the atmospheres of planets going around other stars. It's going to be in the tens to hundreds of light years distance, probably not thousands, but it's going to be able to look at this enormous volume of space around us and do this comprehensive survey. And I think I mentioned last time that it should be able to tell us with about a 90% precision whether or not there's no other life in the universe because it's going to be analyzing these atmospheres it's going to be searching for biosignatures and it's going to tell us whether or not we're alone in the universe uh at, at least in terms of life and maybe we can even find uh extraterrestrial intelligence using this technique as well it's a an amazing telescope and i would really like to know the answer to that question ethan zrempek Fraser, I was wondering if there are any missions in the works to study and colonize Venus. No, there aren't. And actually, this is kind of one of the crises of planetary science, is that right now there are no spacecraft at Venus. The last one was the uh, European Space Agency's Venus Express, and then it died, and now there's nothing at Venus. And the thing is, is that the surface of Venus has been less explored than pretty much any other place, you know, the large objects in the solar system, except for maybe the, you know, the surface of the, the bottom of the ocean. Uh, Venus has only been mapped at very large resolution, so we really need a mission to go back and to map the world at much more detailed resolution. Now, you mentioned explore and colonize. Colonize is a whole other uh, thing to try and go and have people survive on Venus. And the only idea that's been thought of is to have people live in balloons above the surface of Venus at a point where the temperature and pressure are more like Earth level. But again, that's really complicated technology. I would be just glad, and I know most planetary scientists would just love to have a mission go back to Venus to study its atmosphere, study the surface, maybe get another lander down there to survive for a couple of hours to, to try and get do some samples of the rock to understand the history of Venus, what it went through, how did it get so bad, where is it going next? Uh, these are questions that we would love to know the answers to. Aki Lover. A better spacesuit, which is modular and adaptable, will make space work much easier. Divers routinely work in an environment that can be as hazardous as space. Yeah, so you're exactly right. And this was sort of based on the episode that we, uh, what I talked about last time, about what, like, what it would take to survive in space, that you really need grit, but better gear like better spacesuits would be an amazing improvement. Uh, you know, right now, astro astronauts just hate 
They hate their gloves. And if you ever try them on and then try to do anything, they are really tough to work with. I mean, it's amazing that people fix the Hubble Space Telescope with the level of precision that they did with the gloves that are like that. So gloves, better uh, spacesuit air conditioning and heaters and better ways of being able to look around and better ways to be able to move your joints. And there's a ton of experimentation that needs to be done on this. Jacob Miller. Which do you think is the most feasible alternative to chemical rockets that could get us to Mars more quickly? Hall effect, nuclear, etc. Right now, there really isn't a much better alternative to getting people to Mars more quickly than chemical rockets. Humans to Mars. Bigger, more powerful chemical rockets that fire those chemical rockets with put out more propellant and get the spacecraft moving faster. That is really the best feasible system that we've got right now. Now there's a bunch of great ideas. Uh, nuclear rockets have been tested in the past. Uh, Vasimir, which is a, you know, there's a kind of plasma engine. I talked about ion engines, hook up an ion engine to a nuclear reactor. That could work. There's solar sails powered by lasers. There's um, electric drives, combinations. There's this new dipole drive that Robert Zubrin is proposing. So there's a bunch of other ideas, but there just hasn't been enough testing done. If you want to get to Mars right away, we know how to make chemical rockets work. We know how to make them powerful. We know it just takes a ton of fuel. So take the BFR, fly it to space, refuel it, and then just have it fire all of those engines and it'll go very quickly and make its way to Mars in just a few months. But until people have tested out all these other technologies in space several times, we just don't know which of them is gonna work the best. XO444. Do you think it would be possible to terraform Io with ice comets and asteroids since it is warm and volcanic? Create oceans on Io and it might be liquid cooled and stay warm enough because of the gravity of Jupiter and its other moons pushing and pulling on it to keep liquid water. Wow, you like to think big. Um, so, I mean, there's a bunch of reasons why you probably wouldn't want to try and terraform and live on Io. You could absolutely smash it, pelt it with comets. Uh, that would create liquid water on the surface of it for a while, but you've got the tidal forces that are causing all of these volcanic activity on the surface of it. The other thing though, the big problem is that because you're so close to Jupiter, the radiation environment around Jupiter is lethal. It would kill you in a very short period of time if you're anywhere near the surface of Jupiter. And so anyone who's gonna to wanna to try and live on Jupiter is gonna to have to live underground or underwater. So um, it just would be an awful place to live and it, there would be no way to stop that awful radiation coming from Jupiter. So it wouldn't be my first place to, my first choice to go. Ben Appleby. What do you think we can expect from Blue Origin's new Armstrong rocket? We know absolutely nothing about Blue Origin's arm, new Armstrong. So in case you sort of have been following Blue Origin too closely, their rocket that we have seen is New Shepard and it's small and it goes on suborbital hops. The one they're working on is the new Glenn. This is going to be the one that's sort of the competitor to the Falcon Heavy. It's going to be have a reusable bottom stage and it's going to be able to carry pretty big payloads. The one after that is the new Armstrong, and nobody really knows. I've seen speculation about what it could do and be. Um, maybe a competitor to the BFR, but right now, we just don't know. And as soon as we find out any information, I'll, I'll let you know. Blue Origin is kind of funny that way. They work quietly, and they don't really publicize what they're doing until they are ready to make demonstration tests. Um, <clears throat> the, the one thing that I think is different, though, is that SpaceX is very focused on that eventual goal of colonizing Mars, while Blue Origin is focused on that goal of industrializing space itself. So I, I would expect the new Armstrong to be the kind of rocket that would be best for fulfilling those objectives that, that, that Blue Origin has set out. So, but until then, we, there's nothing. And anyone who tells you otherwise, they're just guessing, they're just speculating. So I can't wait to find out more information. Dylan Williams. I've been hearing about dark matter and dark energy for nearly 20 years now. Be interested to know similar time analogies for those other phenomena you mentioned. That's a great question, right? I always talk about this, that, that these things like dark matter and dark energy are in the middle of the mystery right now and people are so impatient, they just want an answer right now. Well, science takes time. And an example that I thought of was quasars, right? Quasars have taken 
took decades. They were first discovered back in like the 60s, and yet it wasn't really until the late 90s, early 2000s that astronomers finally figured out that they were shining because you had matter being fed into supermassive black holes and the matter was piling up and then shining. And now we know what it is. Um, but it took a long time if you asked anywhere in between. It's great. You go back to Cosmos with Carl Sagan back in the 1980s and he talks about quasars and he's like, we don't know what these things are. I suggest they could be black holes, but, but still it's an unsolved mystery. And so that's a great example to show how the science changes. Now, I asked your question to one of my guests, uh, Dr. Sabina Hassenfelder, who wrote this new book, What the uh, Lost in Math, uh, how Beauty leads physics astray. And I got a chance to interview Sabina, but um, she gave you an answer. I asked her that, that question as well, and she provided uh, an example that came to her mind. So check it out and buy her book, Lost in Math. So what comes to my mind uh, would be the problem with the spectral lines of atoms. Uh, so this was discovered uh, in the late 19th century already that um, the absorption and emission lines of uh, atoms come in discrete steps. For example, the Balma series that was uh, discovered around 8080 or something. But it wasn't possible to really explain where that discreteness comes from until um, the development of quantum mechanics. And, uh, you know, it was not only the insight of uh, how to write down the equations, you actually also had to solve the equations. And uh, that, that took a few decades. So it was a big mystery at the time. I'm not, you know, the, just the time comparison I have to add, though, seems to me a little bit unfair because you you have to... Um, factor in that at this time there was there were like a factor hundred fewer physicists <laughs> working on this. So um, if if you factor in the working time as opposed to the the chronological time, then we've been thinking for a very very long time about dark matter and dark energy. All right, thanks, Dr. Hasselfelder. I will put a link to her book and her blog and her Twitter in the sh in the show notes, so you can find out more. Thanks to everyone who asked questions this week. I really enjoy this, so keep them coming, keep them short. Uh, try to ask questions that I haven't answered before. But apart from that, just anywhere on any sh episode, just type a question that pops into your brain. I'll gather them all up and I'll answer them here, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>